Good evening and welcome to this evening's event. It's great to have you with us, whether you are here in person or watching us online. Uh, we hope this will be a really interesting and lively conversation, um, trying to think about the lessons from history about our digital future. My name is Julian Huppert. My day job is running a centre at Jesus College in Cambridge, getting people to think and talk about interesting things. Uh, I'm actually also a recovering politician as well, so quite used to talking about things whether or not I know about them. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, we have a fantastic panel who really do know uh, what we're going to be talking about. Um, now, before we get started, uh, we are, of course, recording this. For th those of you in the room, there are no planned fire alarms, but if there is one, please do go out through the doors over there and let the staff show you where to go. I'm afraid if you are watching online, I have no idea what you do in case of a fire. <laughs> You'll just have to look after yourselves for that. Um, we're really grateful to the Cambridge Festival and the University of Cambridge for hosting us here in the, this wonderful Babbage Lecture Theatre. It's been renovated since I remember being an undergrad sitting somewhere near the back over there uh, listening to some wonderful people, uh, Ron Lasky, David Summers and, and many others. I see a few nods who, who've heard the songs. Uh, and it's wonderful to be back here now. And it's really great to work with the Bennett Institute of Public Policy. It's a really amazing uh, place which I've seen develop into one of the country's leading centres for public policy. Remarkably, it's only, I think, four years old. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in some ways, it's quite astonishing that the university didn't have a proper centre for public policy until so recently. It's doing really good research and really good impact. You don't have to do one or the other. So there's a whole lot of collaborations, cross-disciplinary academic research, and it's working on some of the really big issues. So things like net zero, uh, the UN sustainable, uh, sustainability development goals, um, what you do about widening regional inequalities, and I've participated in some events about levelling up here, governance of the state, and of course, our subject for tonight, digital technology. And so we're just going to, we're not going to ask the panel to talk about all of those things now, we'll just focus on digital technology. But we know that that's having a huge effect on everything we do, whether we talk about smartphones, social media, AI, 5G, virtual reality, smart homes, the things that maybe are coming up in the future. Um, I'll say metaverse before anyone else does. Um, it's changing how we live our lives, how we work, how we play, and the boundaries between all of those. There's huge opportunities huge positives that can come for improving our lives, tackling some of our biggest challenges, you know, climate change, coronavirus, conflict, poverty, all of that. But there's also harms. How do we get the benefits and avoid any of the harms? Governments are trying to, to deal with this, um, to, well, we'll discuss whether they're successful or not, but how do you balance the individual risks, the collective risks, the benefits, and distribute the consequences, economic, political, and so forth, more fairly? So that's our topic, and rather than just speculate about the future without looking backwards, we're going to take the past as our key to think about the future, using history to actually try and predict maybe what will happen and what to look out for. So we have a star team of panellists, I'm going to introduce them in a second, uh, but just to say we're going to hear from each of them for what's been described as a mini keynote. Mm -hmm. So it's five minutes and I will be quite brutal and strict and I will be you know, increasingly rude as we get near to the five minutes. Um, but we're also going to have lots of questions because you in the audience here and online I'm sure have much better questions than I have to ask the panel. Um, so please do put your hand up and wait for the mics if you're here. If you're online, have a look at the Q&A and I will try and bring those questions in. You can ask questions in anonymously if you like, or you can have your name attached to it. I guess the same is true here, but we can see you here. <laughs> so um, our wonderful panel, um, uh, 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 really going to pick up from different perspectives with different starting points. Um, so we're going to start nearest me and then go away. Um, so we'll start with Claire Malamud, um, who is an affiliated researcher at the Bennett Institute and CEO of the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data trying to bring together governments, private sector and civil society to use data and data technology towards the sustainable development goals. So we'll hear from, from Claire. We'll then hear from James, who is author of, of End State, which I hope you've all read, and if not, it's av available from all good bookshops, um, and probably the bad ones as well. Um, and so he's very interested in about the relationship between individuals and the state. Uh, he, he's worked for Gordon Brown, he's worked in the Resolution Foundation, uh, and the charity sector, really thinking about economic change and how, how, that, uh, um, how, pe how that affects people's real lives. And then we're going to hear from Jenny Tennyson, OBE, um, 
you know, you, you accepted it. Um, <laughs> Um, who, who's a founder of Connected by Data, and it is um, putting community at the heart of data narratives, practices, and policies. Uh, she's co-chair of the Data Governance Working Group at the Global Partnership on AI, a Shuttleworth Foundation Fellow, and somebody who it's a lot of fun to be sat next to on a plane, um, as I can personally vouch for. Um, so we're going to hear from them in that order, um, and I will try and keep um, be at least as, as, as reasonable with their timing as with my own. Um, so, Claire, can we start with you? And I, I want to start off with a sort of classic cliche that people always say data is the new oil. Um, and there's lots of interesting comparisons, particularly at the moment, about what we think about oil. How much is that true? And what can we learn from the history of oil and geopolitics to create a better system to manage data? Thank you, Julian. And thank you, everyone. It's great to be here. And I'm still quite thrilled by being in a real room with a real, in, real live, in-person audience. Um, so... I mean, this data in the new in, is the new oil analogy. You know, it's sort of, there's lots of breathless things that went around, possibly. It might be getting slightly passe now, but a few years ago, you couldn't move for articles saying data is the new oil, and it was all so exciting. And it was always sort of said as a really positive, exciting thing, like it's powering the economy, everything's so great. And of course, both data and oil do fantastic, you know, have done and continue to do great things in the economy. You know, we're all grateful to have cars and planes and all the rest of it, perhaps we need to do it very differently now, but um, you know, both have led to huge improvements in living standards. But I was kind of intrigued that the, that the, that the analogy was always made so positively, because at the moment, you know, I'm not sure that we want anything really to be the new oil. When you think about, you know, the IPCC report that came out this week saying the sort of damaging effect that, you know, first of all, the huge, you know, hugely damaging effect that fossil fuels have had on the world. And secondly, the damaging effect that the oil industry has had on the political, you know, on sort of political attempts to deal with it and the way that lobbying and so on has undermined political action. Similarly, when you think about sanctions against Russia, you know, what are the sectors which are the hardest to, uh, to sanction and what are the areas where the politics are most difficult is oil, it's fossil fuels. So I don't think that we really want anything to be the new oil, thank you very much. So this really sort of set me thinking, this analogy data is the new oil, it's a bit of a, you know, everyone who knows about data, but can, you know, there's a million articles that will tell you why data is not the new oil from various sort of technical reasons about the characteristics of data, the characteristics of all. And yet there's something about it that kind of refuses to die. It's a bit of a zombie analogy in the way that, you know, it kind of keeps coming up however many times people try to debunk it. So I think there's something there. And that really made me think, well, is there something there to worry about, <laughs> you know, if, there are so many ways in which data does seem to people to be the new oil. What is it that we can learn about oil and think about what not to do in terms of data? And I think the real thing, you know, the critical thing here is the political power that data, that oil companies have, both in terms of their impact on the national politics of individual states and in terms of the impact on geopolitics and the way that oil and the sort of competition for oil and thinking about the security issues around oil have affected relationships between states. Now, I mean, I think there's two things here, perhaps, just very briefly to say from the history of oil to really watch out for. The first is concentration. The reason why certain governments, the ex countries that export oil have become so powerful is because oil, unlike data, is geographically concentrated. There are countries that have it and there are countries that don't. And if you have it, you're in a more powerful position in the market than if you don't. Data, of course, is not concentrated. It comes from everywhere. It comes from all of us. And yet, we're kind of a bit behaving as if it is. We're almost constructing, in some ways, a policy environment that runs the risk of allowing data to become concentrated because we're not challenging this idea of, you know, the fact that, that if, 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 you know, if your data is produced on a certain platform, that the owners of that platform own the data. Um, there's a few platforms that massively dominate globally, the, the, the social media markets, advertising markets, and so on, and they hold most of the data, and we're not really in our policy thinking, challenging the concentration. I think we're running the risk of kind of completely unnecessarily creating a situation where some of our data companies will have a lot of power in the same way as some of our oil exporting countries have. You know, and you can imagine a scenario kind of a few years down the line where 
a government is coming up for an election and it's desperately trying to negotiate with a social media company about you know, what is the exact algorithm that they're going to run to regulate the news feed around the election. You know, none of us want to live in that world, but if we allow the sort of the, the concentration of data to um, to run unchecked, then I think there is you know there are risks there, and it's not too late. You know we've seen the Digital Markets Act passed in the European Union last week. I think you know there are things that we can do about it now. These are policy choices. The second thing, very quickly, is um, <laughs> is infrastructure. The original the big oil companies in the U.S. didn't make their money from drilling oil. They made their money from controlling the infrastructure. Rockefeller made his money by controlling the railways, not by controlling the oil wells. And I think infrastructure is something that we don't think about enough when we think about data, particularly in terms of inequalities between countries. There are countries, you know, we're drowning in data here, but in Africa, only just over a quarter of the population is using the internet at all. Mm. And these are choices that we're making, again, about infrastructure, and these are public policy areas that can, you know, something can be done now. We're at the beginning of this journey, feels like we've been having these conversations for a long time, but it's very, very young. I do, you know, I do think we've possibly got time to go, got the sort of choice now to go on a different course, but I do think we have to think very hard about how to make sure that data is not the new oil if we're going to avoid some of those pitfalls of the past. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And, and five minutes goes very fast. It and uh, It's astonishing. We do, we do have a clock here. I know, here, but so, I you know. forgot to look at it before I started. <laughs> so, um, but some really interesting themes there about control and about infrastructure and how we do it and how, how do we stop it being the new oil. I think we'll come back to some of those. But I do want to bring James in. Um, so your book, End State, talks about the Industrial Revolution. So we're going back, you know, perhaps even further. What can we learn from the Industrial Revolution? Um, are there things that we should learn, or actually is it just an unhelpful analogy and we should really be giving up on that as an approach? Sure, it's a terrifying clock that is ticking away, <laughs> so I'll jump straight in. Um, I mean, it's a question I'm fascinated by, sort of what is similar and what is not similar between the industrial and the digital revolution. Um, that my, my book, End State, is quite largely based on the idea that there are worthwhile similarities and that the analogy is, an, is at least a useful one to think about. Um, so I often give a talk where I kind of run through all the similarities and I make that argument that the, the two are kind of similar in important ways. The first um, question that always comes from the audience is someone saying that's nonsense, they're completely different. Um, so last week I actually tried a different talk where I talked about how different the two revolutions were and the first question from the audience was that's nonsense they're both <laughs> very similar so um, I'm going to start by saying there are similarities and differences um, um, so to start with a similarity I think and this is sort of um, quite a deep similarity is what I what I call kind of form they're, they're kind of formally similar if that makes sense the two revolutions so um, I think it is true increasingly clear that the digital revolution is a sort of um, what you might call a discontinuity or a break in economic history in the sense that it's the economy that is emerging from it is sort of qualitatively different from the, from the economy we had before. And that is very similar to the industrial revolution in the sense that the industrial economy was not just sort of bigger or faster or noisier you know, than the one we had before. It was, it was a different kind of thing. It was just a fundamentally different kind of economy that worked differently at, at the level of its logic. And it does seem increasingly the case, only really in the last 10 years, I would argue this has become apparent, that the digital economy works differently at the level of its logic to, to what we all, were all used to in the 20th century. Um, I do think that's quite useful as an insight because although it sounds kind of obvious, um, it's important, it tells us what kind of policy work we need to do um, in response to that change. So it tells us essentially that we can't be incrementalist. So we, we know we're not gonna respond to the digital revolution by sort of tweaking the taper rate in universal credit or by tweaking, a, tweaking the basic rate of income tax. That's not the kind of response that we need. We need a deeper, a deeper response that's basically more radical than that and is about uh, reimagining the institutions of the state and probably coming up with some new institutions, whole new domains of public policy that we haven't thought about before and that will seem quite scary, I suspect, um, as those start to emerge. I'm very interested, maybe we can pick this up in conversation, um, about the process by which radical ideas go from seeming radical and impossible to suddenly seeming like common sense over the course of two or three decades. Obviously, that happened a lot in the Industrial Revolution, where big ideas like the welfare state, free education, free healthcare, 
seemed implausible and unaffordable and then suddenly became a new common sense. So that's the kind of transition I think we're going to go through now. And that's, I think, in some ways quite similar. A couple of differences very quickly because the clock is ticking. So um, <laughs> one difference I think is a, a big deal is is the information revolution is obviously intangible in its kind of its core material is intangible is that is data is ideas is information uh, whereas the industrial revolution was obviously a very tangible revolution you know when you read the history from that time you can almost smell it coming off the page it's kind of you know sewage filled the river thames <laughs> uh, children lost their limbs in, in factories um the railway tracks literally didn't line up and so people had to change trains when they moved between different gauges of railway tracks whereas today if you think of the big social problems we're facing they're sort of quite hard to put your finger on so you know mental illness as opposed to physical illnesses like cholera um a kind of distrust populism burnout as a kind of big problem in in the workplace um that's a really different type of set of problems and i think it's not one we're used to solving in public policy i call them soft problems as opposed to hard problems because they're quite hard to kind of get your hands on um, as, a, as a kind of policy maker and a policy thinker. Um, and then the other difference I'm going to point to briefly at the end is um, a, another profound difference, which is sort of where, where are we starting from, which is very different to last time around. So, and this is, I'm going to simplify a lot here in the interest of time, but you know, in response to the Industrial Revolution, we sort of built from scratch the modern policy, the, the modern state. Um, that's not to say there was nothing there before, because of course those reformers were having to push back against all kinds of ideologies and sort of invested interests that, that already existed. But we built the modern state as we know it today, and it didn't exist um, you know, in, in the mid-19th century. What we have to do now is a very different thing, which is change a, an existing state um, with huge complex systems like the NHS, like the welfare system. We have to reimagine that state into something different. And in some senses, I think changing a state is, is harder than building one. Um, and that's, I think, quite a fundamental difference in how this will play out politically um, and in policy terms. So both similar and, and different in, in different ways. Fantastic. So we now need somebody from the audience to say, well, that's rubbish, and it's yeah. not both similar <laughs> and different in different ways. Uh, but again, some really interesting things there about tangibility, about the changing the state. And we, I think we'll come back to some of those themes as well. And I, I'm tempted to talk about the Overton window, but we'll, we'll see if that comes up naturally. So we've talked about oil. We've talked about industrial revolution. Um, We've slightly touched on the, the, the pressures for change when something goes wrong in a scandal. So, Jenny, your essay questions talk about food. That's right. Um, so, when we've had food regulation from allergies, ethics, weight-related issues, how can we learn from food towards data? Is, is, you know, is data the new carrots or the new whatever? <laughs> I'm very glad you asked that question, Julian. <laughs> um, yeah, I've been looking at the relationship between uh, data and food because the, the, the systems and the way that food has an impact on our lives is quite similar to the way that data has an impact on our lives. Um, so food is fundamental, ubiquitous, we all need it. And obviously we all need data, right? Mm -hmm. We need our Wi-Fi, otherwise we get very distressed. Um, it's also a very complex and diverse ecosystem when you're providing food. Like our food chains span the globe. We have diversity in terms of, you know, small coffee shops around the corner versus big international chains. And again, that's very similar when it comes to data. Um, even the small one-person website will be managing people's data. It's not just the big Googles of this world. And the harms and benefits also fall in similar kinds of ways. They fall to us as individuals, right? Uh, we can get food poisoned. We can also um, have our identity stolen, so very personal kinds of impacts. We can have community impacts. So if you look at the uh, levels of sugar intake amongst the poorest in our societies are higher, and therefore they get more obesity. Um, in the same way, we see particular impacts around the use of data on minoritized communities. And then there are big systemic kinds of things. So our food ecosystem affects our climate in the same way as our data ecosystem affects our climate. So um, those impacts at all of those different kind of scales seem the same as well. So it's really interesting then to look at how food has been regulated, in particular in the UK, how that system of regulation has, has turned up and what lessons we might draw about data. And I could go on for ages, but I'll try and make it very quick. Um, 
in the early in the early to mid 19th century there was just an epidemic of adulteration of food so practically no food stuff that you could get didn't have some kind of extra material added to it to change its color to bulk it out you know you had chalk in milk lead in sweets you had alum in bread and you had this group of citizen scientists who started looking at how to detect this adulteration, actually understanding how to, to put it out. Um, and they, they studied it and found that no bread had no alum in it. Every single bread that they piece of bread that they tested had alum in it, for example. Then in 1858, there was the Bradford lozenge scandal, <laughs> right, where they meant to adulterate this with um, powdered gypsum, what was called DAF, um, to put it into the, the sugar, but instead accidentally adulterated it with arsenic. And 200 people were poisoned, 21 people died as a result of this. And that kicked off this whole set of legislation that happened in the, in the mid to late 19th century. Um, and there are five kind of really interesting pieces that you see in this legislation that kind of have carried through to today. Um, they put in place a testing infrastructure, public analysts who could detect adulteration in food and would provide reports. Where are our professionals that, that audit data systems and AI systems and just give a report about what it does? They put into place um, incentivization for due diligence up and down the food chain so that the shopkeeper would want to check their supplier to make sure they weren't selling adulterated food. How are we keeping websites liable for the ad tech that they put on their, um, uh, on their sites? We have a whole history of honest labelling around food, and obviously we have privacy policies in our, uh, when it comes to data. But in labelling of food, there's now a focus on harms, like this will make you hyperactive, right? Um, whereas in our... Uh, focus on privacy policies, it's all about our rights. You don't see your rights around food, your consumer rights listed on labels. Why is that? Um, there's also a whole thing about enforcement, prisons and uh, destruction of property when it came to, to food. Um, what if AI systems were destroyed when they were found to be harmful rather than giving people leeway to just adjust them? Where are our routine inspections of those that are using data that not only provide assurance but also provide support to people who are running these systems and help to get help them to increase their capability. And then more recently we've seen consumer nudges around the consumption of sugar, um, for example, so sugar tax on, on um, sugar in, in, in drinks and also not being able to do two-for-one deals with sugary food. And this is really where we start to recognise how the system influences our decisions as individuals, right? We see that when we go to the supermarket, there's chocolate there, you grab it on the way out, and now there's a law that stops you from having that in your supermarket. Where are the similar kinds of things that help us to avoid these dark patterns that, that nudge us into bad behavioural choices as individuals around data. Um, so that's my quick run through. Um, but the kind of lessons that I'm drawing from that are, are you know, our data regulation um, was put in place for a different kind of world and it's unfit for the complexity, the ubiquitousness, the diversity of our data ecosystem now. We've had 150 years of food legislation. We've got a lot to do quickly when it comes to data. Mm. And what's the scandal that triggers change? It's my last point, don't worry, Drew. Mm. Um, where we've had like Cambridge Analytica, we've had the qualification scandal, the mutant algorithms, um, but there will be another scandal is whether we'll be ready with our kind of policy uh, choices to, to respond to that quickly to get the right legislation in place. Mm. Thank you. Um, and thanks to all three of you, we are much less behind than I'd expected, which is fantastic. <laughs> um, so we're going to have a couple of questions from me as an opportunity for you to think of things that you'd like to talk about, and for those of you online to use the Q&A feature uh, to put questions in. Can I just pick up on a thread that all three of you have somewhat touched on in the analogies, which is this, this thing about tangibility? Because I found myself thinking, you know, it's easy to understand the concept of people being poisoned by arsenic, and it's very easy to understand that's bad and you don't want it to happen to you. One thing that I've found quite shocking is that 
what look to me like astonishing misuses of data are often just forgotten later. You know, vast amounts of data that get lost to people. You know, there, there's been any number of scandals, mm. but nobody's noticed. Um, and I think that's a distinction with some of the, the sort of health problems that you saw in the Industrial Revolution, obviously with oil. How, is, is data just completely different because it's so intangible? Do we have to do more to get people to see the realities of it? Who, does anybody want to respond to any of what I've said? I mean, I think it's both tangible and intangible to take the, the theme of the, <laughs> <laughs> of the evening. I mean, what's interesting is, you know, in my organisation, we work with partner governments around the world. And for some of them, data is extremely tangible, for example, because it's become a subject of discussion in trade deals. So they are, you know, data has become part of diplomacy and part of commercial policy and part of foreign policy. And that is extremely tangible because it's both it's tangible partly in itself because people are making decisions now that they think are going to affect the, the prospects for their own businesses, for their own industries, their chance of competing in this industries of the future. It's also tangible because they're being invited by their trading partners to trade data off against other things. You know, will okay, you can have this data bit of the trade deal, but we want something else in return. So I think there are ways in which, at least in the sort of geopolitics of data, it's actually surprisingly tangible. Mm. I'll pick up again, um, and again, I do think that there's a food analogy here, um, but there's, there's a thing about how um, individual impact from bad food, you know, if you vomit the next day, then you have it very, very tangibly. And you can see that when you have, as I said, you know, identity theft. That is something that affects people very saliently. Um, but there is lots of the, the impacts of, of data and, and the kind of... Um, the way that it works, that are impossible for you to even detect as an individual. When you are being given a price that is higher than other people around you, when your search results are, are changed because you're in a particular kind of filter bubble, when you are um, shown and, and misinformation is, is kind of put at the top of your feed, you can't compare what you are seeing to what other people ho have seen. So it becomes invisible. And I suppose, you know, the analogy is that some of the food poisoning type um, issues were also invisible. It took ages for people to, to, to realise that um, a particular um, contaminant in some beer was what was causing a whole set of people to become ill, like the, the, mm. the, the link between the, the, the contaminant and that was, was difficult to trace because it's a complex system. So I, I don't think it's quite so... Um, uh, I, I think the, the, the systemic impacts is what we worry about and that are very difficult for individuals to see, and that's the bit that makes it non-salient. James? Yeah, I think this is just a really big deal, the intangibility of the social problems today, because I think um, if you think about the kind of mechanisms by which... That, that, that point I made about kind of radical ideas go from seeming completely implausible to being accepted, the mechanism by which that happened in um, industrial history was often this kind of mounting sense of crisis, very tangible crisis. So the kind of my, one of my favourite examples is the big stink in London where um, you know, sewage literally, literally piled up in the streets and the Thames you know, was kind of black, kind of ran black um, with sewage. Um, and you get these exasperated letters written to the Times newspaper with people saying, I can't breathe, kind of for the smell in London. Um, and the radical idea that emerged was um, the idea of a public sewer system which people dismissed as a kind of dangerous act of government overreach when it was first kind of mooted in, in the sort of early 19th century. And then it became obvious that, that something had to happen, and so the kind of politics moved on, um, because the problem was just so damn tangible that it was just kind of there to see. Um, and I do think um, that's not happening in the same way now, because so many of these problems are... Um, they're very real problems, very serious problems causing real harm, but they're kind of... They've got this intangibility to them of anxiety, stress, burnout, mental ill health. Um, and so they're not kind of in that, they're not in our faces in, in quite the same way. And I do worry about what that does. Do, do we get these same moments of kind of something must change here? And do you get that same mechanism where the mm. crisis triggers the change? Um, I do think one, one final point is um, kind of representatives played quite an important part historically. So um, classically, the trades unions who were able to kind of galvanize working people and 
act as a voice and a force for change and amplify people's voices. Um, and there's just something interesting question for me about who represents, say, data users. Who, who are the representative bodies that can say, we need this? That they, they're kind of missing from the debate, I would say. Mm -hmm. So I want to come on back on to some of that. But Claire, did you have something to add? I mean, just a point on this intangibility, I think it's really interesting. And I think that's partly why we're so obsessed with analogies in the data space. You know, is data like oil? Is data like land? Is data like water? Is data like music? Um, and I think that's because partly the intangibility, we sort of don't know how to think about it. So we're constantly looking around for something which we do understand, which is tangible, that we can hook on to this debate and somehow make it meaningful for, and sort of help us to understand how to think about it. And I think a big part of this problem, and perhaps a link to why we haven't also haven't seen any of these sort of strong civil society movements yet around data is because we don't kind of know how to think about it. I mean, this may be a, another version of the intangibility issue, but I think it's, it's the sort of intangibility expressed in sort of political models and political activism. How do we think about what data is and our place in it and what we want to happen if we sort of still don't really know what it is and we keep casting around for these analogies and they're all a bit unsatisfactory and eventually we have to agree on what data is, not what it's like, so I think. Just, just building up on that, and I, I'm assuming you'll stick with the theme of saying, you know, both yes and no to every single question. <laughs> um, do policymakers understand what they're talking about? Do politicians understand what's happening? Um, you know, and, and, and what could we do to help them in the broader senses to understand what the issues are as well as how to tackle them? I, I, I want to come off the fence. So I think, <laughs> I thought you um, no, they do not. Um, I say that, I, uh, I think of myself as a policymaker, so kind of we do not. Um, and I think it's partly that point that um, we reach for we, we, we reach for pre-existing um, mental models, concepts, words, um, and most of a lot of them, a lot of the most fundamental concepts that we use in public policy no longer work, no longer have purchase. So I was in a, a very interesting discussion last week. I think it was about um, data ownership. Um, where we were kind of debating, can you even own data? What does it does it make any sense to say <laughs> I own this data? And a lot of our um, initial attempt to think about data and regulate data was based on this concept mm. of that's my data, so can I have it, please? And that makes absolutely no sense in the context of data because someone else can have the data and you can still access the data. So I do think um, that's just a really recurring problem that we kind of just take these pre-existing, if you like, sort of pre-digital concepts like ownership. Um, a lot of the most fundamental concept in economics, likewise, sort of no longer really quite work, um, and so we, and we think those those words mean the same thing now, and they don't. And I think the policy community is particularly sort of prone to that of saying things like, you know, Uber drivers are they employed or are they self-employed? They're kind of neither. Mm. They're kind of neither. So let's sort of, you know, we try and sort of stuff the mattress back into the box, but it's you know we need some new concepts and new um, new ways of thinking about these things. To your to your point. Is somebody going to defend policymakers? I, well, I'm not, but I'm going to sort of slightly be slightly further on the fence. Um, I mean, I don't think policymakers understand this stuff, but I think in the sector in which we operate, which is roughly speaking the sort of broadly international development sector, I'm never very happy with that label, but let's stick with it for now. You know, I think part of the problem is, at least in this sector, we're so sort of hooked on the technology and on the technical issues. You know, there's millions of dollars being poured into training people to be data scientists. And we, not that we don't need more data scientists, absolutely we do, but that is not the solution to getting governments to, to think more intelligently and regulate more effectively and develop better policy on data. You don't want data scientists, you want policy makers who can understand, know enough to understand what data scientists do and what questions they can ask and answer through data science. But it's a, t it's a different skill set. How to be an effective policymaker, an effective manager of data science projects in the public sector, an effective policymaker and regulator and lawyer and all of the other things, skills that you need is different. And I think, at least in the international development sector, the, you know, there's always this sort of assumption that it's basically a supply side problem. You just pump more data scientists into the system and everything will miracle and they will sort it out. And I think we're sort of lining up another set of problems for ourselves because there's a whole sort of set of issues on the demand side. Who's going to be using these data scientists? Who's going to be commissioning the products? Who's going to be thinking about what 
problems in the public sector we want data science to solve and how can we organize institutions and systems to make it so. So I think, I don't think policymakers are ready and I think we're not even thinking about, at least in the international development sector, we're not giving enough thought to even how to get people ready, let alone you know, actually then supporting people when they're in that position. Okay. I'm going to be a little bit defensive of policymakers, because why not? Well, <laughs> so we have the full span. Um, I mean, it's, it's really easy to, in particular, to ridicule politicians like full stop, but, but in, um, particularly around, around data and algorithms where, where they talk about mutant algorithms or the idea that we have to get rid of all algorithms when that is just how we use data. That's not, it's not something that you can get rid of. Um, but I think that you know, the, the, A, it's technical, B, it's new, C, it's complex, right? It's, it's um, a, and interconnected, it's a systemic kind of, uh, it, it's built into the systems that we operate in. It's an international problem. It has all of those features that just make it very hard. Um, and I don't think that any of us even, are like, outside of, uh, I, I suppose I can view myself as a wonk and therefore part of the policymaker community as well. But um, even those of us who are embedded in it can't come up with the, this is the solution. This is the thing that you should do because all of those things are, are, are just very difficult. So I think we should cut some policymakers a little bit of slack around um, their ability to respond. I think, um, uh, James, your point um, is a bit about how we gradually iterate ourselves there, right? It's about what, where do we, th what's the big vision about where we could get to so that we have at least uh, something to, to cling on to and then how do we experiment in a way that is um, sensitive and that, that uh, is rational and that, that kind of um, helps us to get to the right kind of solutions, recognizing that we, don't, we won't know the answers from here and f uh, from, from where we are, but we should be searching for them. So can we perhaps think a bit about sort of the structures that we need to manage all of this? Because the three areas you've all spoken about all led to a whole set of new organisations, new institutions, new, new, new constructions to manage something new. Um, I'm going to assume that you all think that there needs to be some new things. What are they? And how, how do we get them even remotely right? Who feels like starting? I think, Jenny? I mean, I, I'm happy to. So um, one of the big strands of work that, that um, we were doing at the Open Data Institute when I was there and, and is continuing is around um, data institutions and the new kinds of organisations that we need to steward data mm -hmm. on behalf of uh, groups and communities and societies. And we already have data institutions that we rely on, so Office of National Statistics, the Met Office, right, Ordnance Survey, they are already these existing um, data institutions. But there is a huge active field of research around the new types of data institution that we need, ones that are created kind of bottom-up with the representatives that you were talking about, James, um, so, so that individuals uh, kind of contribute data into an organisation that then chooses how to share it in a kind of collective way. Um, and these uh, kinds of intermediary organisations that can act as the institutional home for data when we see it as a more common good, as a community good, these are the kinds of organisations that we're going to, to need. Um, they have all the problems that you have with, with uh, organisations, you know, how, how are they funded, how are they sustainable, how do they actually get the voice of the community into the stewardship of that data. But this is the strand of, of research that we really mm. need to push on, I think. Mm. I mean, I think in oil, the sort of pitfall to avoid is the, apart from governments and companies, which obviously are the preeminent institutions in oil, the, the sort of the specific organizations that came about, the first perhaps kind of institution that came about globally at least in the oil market was OPEC, it was the producers organization. So it was very much the producers getting together to sort of defend their interests, defend their prices. 
and any the, the institutions that were really trying to sort of reconcile the interests of producers and consumers and you know communities where the oil was coming from things like the extractive industries transparency initiative and others followed a long way later and when the market was very well developed and very concentrated and perhaps it was a little bit too late so i think you know one of the lessons from the oil sector here is very much you know wouldn't start from here and try to make sure that the institutions that are set up are kind of balanced between the different interests and perhaps the one good example to take from the oil sector and I'd be interested if there's anyone in the audience who I'm sure knows more about this than I do and may tell me why it's not a good example is the is the um, trust fund that the Norwegian government set up to try to manage the revenues from oil and make sure that they were used, that they were sort of stewarded over the long term and that they were used to, to benefit the society over the long term. And I think that is the one example perhaps that you can point to from the oil sector in trying to reconcile the kind of producing and consume, you know, the different interests at play and think about kind of what you want over the longer term rather than just thinking about the kind of immediate market interests, which has been the, the history of institutions in the oil sector. I think there's a lot of lessons there of what to not do. Mm. James, um, so yeah, definitely agree. There's a kind of there's a whole tranche of sort of missing institutional architecture, I guess, in in data in particular. Um, the, the two other points I'd add is um, there's a whole bunch of institutions that are sort of misclassified because um, things have changed under our feet. So, so the example would be the big the big platforms, so Facebook, Google, Amazon, to some degree, which are legally speaking. Just private companies. They're kind of you know, they're sort of classified as the same as a small shop in America, kind of, um, and they're, they're within the same legal regime essentially. And the idea that they're that that's an appropriate legal regime for these globally significant you know, infrastructure platforms is just kind of is just madness. And so you see them making these decisions and having these this power that no private company should have. So who who can speak and who can't speak? Um, you know, banning Trump, having you, might, you may agree or disagree with that as, a, as an individual decision. How can a private company have the, have the right, have the power to decide this person can't speak now in our main sort of public forum? Um, so I think those, that's a good example, they're just misclassified and we need to come up with a new classification, a new sort of concept for what they are. It's a new, it's a new thing that we haven't had before. We'll, we'll need to give it a name and it will need to come with new responsibilities and new kind of... Um, requirements and new new con new governance new controls um the other the other point i make is we need to reform quite fundamentally reform some some of the kind of core institutions of the state so um the most obvious being the big whitehall department which is you know it looks more antiquated by the year as a kind of you know these kind of big hierarchical bureaucratic relatively siloed um organizations which look nothing like the kind of economy that they're increasingly having to to govern they look like a sort of mid 1950s corporation, really, in the way that they function. Um, and so there's something about just um, quite, quite fundamentally reimagining what the state looks like so that it can be more agile, more iterative. You know, the, the policy making process is very slow. It's kind of, uh, we don't think we don't quite write the law in vellum anymore, but nearly. Um, and we might as well for how long it takes to mm -hmm. pass a new law and then change it. So there's something about just kind of making the state much more kind of able to adapt quickly and try things out and experiment. Can I step even bigger than the state and think about the global nature of some of this? Because my understanding of the history of, of food regulation, industrial revolution, obviously, was that it happened very in a very patchwork way around the world. Some places did their own thing in, in completely different ways, and still now we have that. Whereas oil was more global, I think, from, from fairly early on. Correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. Um, what do we need to think about with data and do we, should we aim for one set of global rules? I mean, is it possible that there will be agreement between the US, the European Union, and China? Um, you may want to talk about Russia and some of the questions that have come up over the last month or so about um, its control of data and, and use of data for uh, military or geopolitical spaces. What do we think about when we think about all of these problems from a global perspective? I mean, I, I think this is where I'm sort of very finely balanced between optimism and pessimism. I think there are, there are, there's a lot of it, you know, there's a lot of sort of 
multilateralism about that's happened, or there's a lot of kind of glo things with a global significance that are happening. There are national or regional policies, like everything the European Union does has a global significance because of the way in which, you know, these companies are global. And so what looks like national policy actually is global, um, you know, and that's, you know, that is probably one of the kind of best ones which is out there, but it can also, if you're making policy from a global perspective that ha from a national perspective that has global implications, you know, you're going to exclude companies that can't meet the requirements if that's not sort of what was in your mind to start with. So there are, un there are unforeseen consequences. So there are sort of national policies that have a global impact. Then there are national policy policies which are deliberately designed to have a global impact, like trade policy, like you know, tr government, like the the sort of trade stance that companies are taking in WTO negotiations, and some of the aid and investment policies of countries, you know, most famously China, but they're not really alone in sort of trying to actively influence other countries, um, other countries' data policies through their through different kinds of, of global relationships, but from a national interest standpoint. There are, you know, there are sort of slight kind of coalitions of the willing that haven't really sort of quite got going. So the, the Japanese government tried to start something in the G20 about data flow free with trust and sort of trying to have it both ways on freedom, but also some protections it doesn't, didn't quite get the sort of required level of traction to really start to influence um, some of those those more sort of regulatory bodies, but there have been attempts at those kind of multilateralism through coalitions of the willing. There are lots of activity on this at the UN in different places. The UN Secretary General has really made this quite a key part of his platform for his what's now at the sort of very beginning of his second term, and really does think I think that the UN has a role to play here. You know, they can't, if it can't kind of think about something like this, which is such a sort of obviously global issue, then kind of what's it for? Again, I think you know, with varying levels of success. So I think I think the sort of bare bones of a of a global process, you know, we might look back in 20 years and go, oh, that was the beginning of that good yeah. stuff that happened. Yeah. Or we might look back in 20 years and say, ha ha, you know, what were they thinking that they could solve the problem that way? Because then these awful other things happened and obviously that was never going to work. And I kind of not, I wouldn't put a bet either way at this mm. point. I mean, let, let's meet back here in 20 years time. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to go? Yeah, I'm happy to. So, um, uh, I, I work uh, with the um, Global Partnership for, on AI, which is, uh, is supposed to be a global body. In fact, is just a set of about 18 of those kinds of countries good. that happen to yeah. get together and have some, um, some commonality. Um, so so it, it's good to see those kinds of alliances kind of taking place in order to, to get to some, um, some level of some subset of global norms. I think the thing that I um, keep coming back to, though, is that uh, data and its impact do, uh, and digital and its impact, do have different impacts in different places, and our norms are different in different kinds of places. So I'm doing some work at the moment with Research ICT Africa, looking specifically at how to bring an African voice into the debates that we have around, at a global level, around AI ethics, data ethics, and, and data governance, and what that should look like, um, which are partly informed by the different kind of, you know, the blind spots that, that we have around uh, the, the impacts of data just because we function in the, in the global north in particular ways. Um, and are partly informed by the kind of traditional decision-making structures that you find in, in Africa. So the Ubuntu tradition, which is much more collective in its thinking, for example. And so I think that there, there, uh, there is definitely work to do at, at an international level around, around standards, around um, having institutions that are stewarding data even at that international level as well. Um, but I do think we need to leave quite a lot of room for some differences when it comes to the to, uh, data governance and, and digital governance, just because the context makes such a difference to how we view the use of those kinds of technologies, and, and it is different in different localities. Mm. James? Um, I, I, th I thought I was an optimist on 
<laughs> on, on the global aspects of this. I had, um, in an early draft of my book, I had a chapter on this kind of question of the sort of global, global institutional architecture, I guess you'd call it, and um, my editor says it was too depressing. <laughs> <laughs> so I took it out. Um, uh, so it obviously wasn't quite as optimistic as I thought. Um, my, the reasons I thought it was optimistic, so, so A, partly the point you make, Claire, about um, single blocks, as long as they're powerful enough, can, can have a kind of, can, can essentially set global regulations in the sense that the EU or the US are, are sufficiently significant markets that if they do um, lean into some of these debates around privacy and so on, then the big tech platforms sort, sort of just end up adopting that as their kind of global... Well, adopting that globally, subject to other than certain um, regions where we now have separate internets essentially sort of breaking off. But um, so I, that, 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 and that kind of makes me feel quite optimistic that we can sort of make progress even without a consensus internationally. Um, I also think civil society is quite, there are some very interesting examples in the last couple of years. Um, so things like our world in data that people might know about, which was just a, it's just a fantastic civil society initiative that just puts amazing live data out there and was obviously very powerful in the pandemic, mm. um, putting data in people's hands around what was happening globally on the pandemic. Um, and that's basically just a sort of civil, so civil society initiative, not working through governments. Um, so there's a sort of emergent global, emerging global civil society in the tech, tech for good space, I guess you might call that. Um, so I kind of, yeah, I thought that was an optimistic take. Maybe it wasn't quite optimistic enough for the book. And um, I guess I do think it's, it's, yeah, we've got a long way to run. We've got a long way to run in the kind of, when it comes to global institutions. So we've had a number of questions from me, but we're now going to take questions from you in the audience. And we've got a few who have already come in online. If you have a question here, can you put your hand up? And I'll try to get one of our wonderful mic runners um, over to you. So if we start off with just up there. Uh, yes, just to drive home um, this idea of the in, um, uh, how um, not intransigent, I've lost the word, of, of, of data, the, uh, how difficult, how intangible, intangible data is, that's the one. Um, with the, uh, it may be a bit naive to think of data as the content of databases as uh, being names and addresses and this sort of thing. Um, with the advent of AI systems, uh, AI algorithms are looking at patterns of data, and what's more, those patterns of data might be transient. Um, and so the regulation may need to be in the uh, um, uh, moderation of how uh, the AI systems are responding to transient patterns of data and you know the thinking has to be far beyond that of could you make this a question that we can answer <laughs> um no it was an observation <laughs> um, well i mean are, are the policy makers thinking far enough ahead so how do we um, think about in in terms of what data actually is mm. Yeah, I, I think that, um, I think you're you're right about that. There have been there's been a tradition of thinking about data, as you say, in this quite kind of static way that has been really. Um, it's transformed over the past 20 years. So, you know, you've got so many more sensors, satellite imagery, so much more digital kind of streams. And the way that it's used in the kind of big data algorithms just means that um, we, we are, as you were saying, pulling out patterns instead of, um, in, instead of just making decisions on like one individual uh, um, record. And that does change how we need to think about how, how we regulate it. So it means that we get linked to other people who are like us in, in databases. Not just, we're not just made, uh, judged based on our own information. We're judged based on our links with other people. Data becomes relational. It becomes something that is collective. And our regulation doesn't, doesn't handle that at all. We don't have regulation that is focusing on the harms that can come from or the impacts, whether they're beneficial or harmful, that can come from the use of algorithms, AI systems, the use of data. We still are focusing on its collection and, and um, how it gets processed, not on 
the, the outputs, which is when you've got these big, complex systems, is what we really need to focus on. So. We don't all have to answer every no, question. I want to hear the next question. <laughs> so, um, so the next question, I think, was just in front over there. Are there any over here? I'll do the ones on light. Yeah. Thanks so much. Um, there's a really interesting example that you probably come across of the Times defending people throwing sewage out of the window in Victorian Britain, saying it's sort of it's a gentleman's right. Um, <laughs> and it, this sort of sparks some of the things uh, you've been talking about today. And I wonder if the resistance to how we deal with uh, negative externalities, particularly around um, government, government um, sort of tending into nanny statism, how much that there's a similarity between the Industrial Revolution or any other sort of particular part of history that you're a specialist in uh, and today with the digital revolution. Mm. James, you want to start us off on this one? Yeah, I mean, um, it's fascinating here. When you see the arguments made, uh, I, I find it actually makes me very optimistic when you look back at the... Um, <laughs> the arguments made against things like banning child labour, where people said it would be kind of a catastrophe for, Brit for British manufacturing. Um, it, it, and always the argument is government overreach is kind of just a repeated <laughs> argument, a repeated refrain of um, public sewers, as I said, were seen to be this kind of terror, kind of a thin end of the wedge <laughs> kind of argument. Um, and similarly with them, um, you know, with the NHS and, and with them um, free education, for example, um, it, there's always this argument of kind of, um, where, where will this go next? And this kind of fear of the state meddling in our lives. Mm -hmm. um, and it also takes, uh, one thing that's fascinating is just how long it can take for seemingly obvious problems to be solved. So the other example I love is the, um, the Gage Wars, which were this kind of crazy period in history that for those who don't know, where um, in the kind of railway boom in Britain, um, the two great engineers of the time, Brunel and Stevenson, had different, different views about how far apart the railway tracks should be laid. One of them laid them wide and one laid them narrow. And of course, they both set to building lots of railway, laying lots of railway tracks. Um, and so wherever their tracks met, they didn't link up. And so you had to literally stop one train and every passenger had to get off that train and onto a wide gauge train and then kind of re-embark. Um, and it took something like 60 years for the gauge wars to be, <laughs> to, to fully come to an end. And, and even after the government said there must be one standard gauge for railway tracks, um, they still, there was a loophole and they got to still build in the <laughs> west of England different gauge tracks. And so eventually they had to actually physically, once they did enforce a standard gauge, they had to physically lift on all the wide gauge tracks, they had to physically move one track closer to the other so that it would work on the standard gauge. And then finally trains could pass between these two separate systems. So I guess the point there is just kind of, it can take a long time for, for things that now seem to us completely obvious and at the time, you know, MPs, very smart people, stood up in Parliament and argued for why this was a kind of outrageous infringement on our liberty to enforce a single standard gauge for railway tracks. So I think we should be used to some of this taking... We should, we should expect some of this to take quite a lot of time, but I feel very confident that it will... There's a certain insistence to the process that it will happen in the end. Some of us still remember having to change trains at Royston. Because <laughs> yeah. the there, there was not, as I see some people remember this, there was not a direct train to Cambridge. You had to, you had to all get out and get back on again. Claire? I wonder if there is also, and I'm just thinking about this as I'm talking, so it may not bear examination, but I wonder if there's also an analogy with sort of periods where, with perhaps the creation of the NHS and a moment when a market actually changed quite quickly that there was a market for healthcare in this country in a particular way that, you know, we thought of the role of doctors in society and the sort of economic relationship between doctors and patients and, and where that set in. And then, you know, it was changed really relatively quickly. And doctors, as we know, you know, fiercely opposed um, the creation of the NHS and it was felt that this was a kind of gross infringement of, of people's right to, their, to run a business effectively in the way that they wanted that they wanted to. And that changed quite quickly. And obviously, I don't think it's going to happen in the same way. But just thinking about what you were saying, James, about, you know, these big platform companies being kind of, you know, a different kind of beast, that we use the same rules to govern the market in platforms as we do to govern the market in, in, um, in corner shops. And maybe something like the creation of the NHS, a moment when actually government just said, no, we're going to do it like this now, and lots of people shouted and screamed, but it happened, and I think it's worked out okay. Um, and, you know, that could also be an interesting analogy, I think. And it's, well, fascinating. Yeah, it's fascinating, I think, that the, the thing that is certain is that in, in, in 2050, 
things will be the case in public policy that we, we today find unimaginable and yeah. would laugh at. And so, and those ideas, because it takes a long time, those ideas will be here today. So there, there will be ideas out there in the world today which will become, which seem completely radical to us and unaffordable and that by 2050 will be the new common sense. So you can do a kind of, um, you can kind of go looking. That's kind of what I do in, in my book is you sort of, you can go looking for what those ideas might be. Um, and it's fascinating because they'll be out there. So I'm, I mean, one of one candidate is something like the four day week, which I think is, is kind of emerging before, before our eyes as something that is becoming a bit of a new norm and is gathering momentum that currently seems a bit out there. And I would imagine by 2050, that will seem completely normal. And there'll be others out there, which I just think is a fascinating kind of time to be alive and to watch that play out. So it's interesting to think about these different analogies. The NHS is a fascinating one, though, of course, GPs are still largely private businesses. Still haven't quite made <laughs> but it in there. a very different kind of market. Which it, is yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, discuss. Um, but can I move us on to a question from online from Luisi Bartolo, um, who talks about um, when it comes to collective harms of AI systems, one of the regulation analogies is from the environmental sector with issues designed to deal with longer term distributed cumulative harms. Um, there's already been a bit of comment about this, particularly, I think, uh, from Jenny. Um, but but Louise is really curious to hear more about how food regulation, for example, could help us deal with some of these long-term collective or societal harms. Yeah, I, 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 um, I hear that analogy with kind of uh, uh, with uh, climate action um, quite a lot, which always makes me very depressed because, of course, we're <laughs> not doing very well on, on climate. So, um, hence, like looking at other kinds of areas, I think is, is quite interesting. Um, so, yeah, I think that the kinds of um, things that I went through earlier around the way that food is regulated does give us some um, hope for addressing some of those more collective harms. If you look in particular at the, um, at the more recent kind of ways in which harms are, from food are being addressed, particularly around obesity and sugar, which I mentioned, but also around um, their climate impact, you're starting to see the use of these behavioral kind of nudges, because there's a recognition that we do all want to be in control of the food that we eat, right? Um, but actually, it's shaped by the market, the offer, the way in which food is presented to us will influence what we, what we choose to eat. Um, and so uh, having things like the levies on, on sugary drinks, having things like um, uh, things that discourage um, shops from presenting options that we actually need to discourage as a society, those are things that I think we can learn from moderately quickly in the, in the data arena. Um, Recognising that the choice architectures that we're presented with as individuals are things that we can choose to shape in, in different ways in order to get to a different collective kind of impact, I think is really promising. Okay. I would go a little bit further because I don't think it's all about simply the choice architecture. I think that's been one of the problems with the approach, you know, not so much now, but perhaps in sort of 10, 15 years ago on climate, that it was all about individual choice. Yes. Yeah, I agree. Oh, you know, just turn your lights off, turn your thermostat down and everything will be fine. And actually, these are kind of system-wide issues. Similarly with food, there's a whole system out there of commercial agriculture which goes beyond what any individual can do with choice. So I, and I think, so I think, and I think the same applies with, with data. There are things that we can do by not accepting cookies and all of those things, but actually... I think we need to think at both levels. I think that's true of climate, it's true of food, I think it's true of data. So, okay. so I completely agree that it's not at the individual level, which is why the choice architecture is the thing that's important, because mm. it's, the, it's the how the choices are set up for us as individuals, recognising that we're swayed in all kinds of ways and don't make sensible choices in, in these contexts. So how we get more collective control over that choice architecture is the point I was making. And there's an interesting question about who's pushing for what framings. I mean, the idea of carbon footprints was very much pushed by the fossil fuel industry because mm -hmm, if you think yeah. it's your fault for not turning your charger off it's not their fault right. exactly. James did you want to yeah I mean the other and reason the food analogy is a good one I think is the kind of addiction the incentive on these firms to make their services addictive and mm. to create this kind of um and I think this is again this is one of those really big sort of world changing issues that um that that is that is very because because the so particularly the social media platforms are entirely incentivized to acquire more and more um, of our attention and so they are addictive i mean that is that is the whole thing they're trying to do is to make their services more and more addictive and hard to tear us hard to tear ourselves away from so that we 
spend ever more of our time with them and put, give them ever more of our data. And, um, and that's, I think you can't deny that. And so they're, they're trying to create addiction. Um, and as you say, we can't deal with that kind of systemic level addiction on an individual basis. Any of us who's tried to sort of uh, don't have the phone in the bedroom kind of <laughs> don't have the phone at the, tea, at the table and suddenly two days later you've got the phone in the bedroom. Um, it's close to impossible to sort of make an individual level intervention to stop these kinds of addictions um, and it creeps back up. So we're going to have to have some kind of um, yeah, systems level systems level intervention to stop that, I think. Thank you. There's a question at the back over here. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. And uh, since we're talking about analogies, uh, there's, a, there's one uh, that's been circling in my head uh, I, that might well have been mentioned uh, before because I missed the initial bit of the talk. But uh, I'm, this one really touches on a bit of a darker side of governing digital future, that is the rise of social surveys. To me, it is a very close analogy to a lot of the element of data and the more dangerous element we're facing now because since the 1850s, since the onset of massive social surveys in Britain and then its exporting into the colonies around the world, there it's the beginning essentially of governing by categorizing people and it's by stratifying people. And Wallace, it didn't really wreak havoc on a massive scale in Britain. It did contribute to genocide and ethnic cleansing in Europe and beyond. And I think that's a darker side of governing. And I think, in, interestingly, because in terms of food adulteration, it doesn't really give the government massive power to do things to its population, well as data now can. It is a tool inside of the hands of those who can govern. Can we make this a question it, that we can answer? Yes, I, I'm going to get to a question very soon. Very soon. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, it, in terms of now the massive expanded tool range that's available to the governors, can you comment on briefly the dangers of governing in the age of digital future? Mm. Claire. Thank you. I mean, I think this is such an important question. You know, in the work that we do with governments on, on governance of data and, you know, the question of sort of inclusivity agency, the relationship between people and data, this comes up again and again. And what we find is that you get two kind of equal and opposite problems. You get people who are included in data in a way which, as you suggest, can you know, means that a, a government which has a sort of malicious intent can identify them, can discriminate against them, can do all kinds of terrible things. There are also other groups who are campaigning fiercely to be included in data. Disability campaigners, campaigners from some ethnic minorities and so on, because they feel it's absolutely critical that their particular... Um, you know, that their particular sort of needs, that they're, that they're visible in the data, so that the fact that they are discriminated against, for example, or that they have worse health outcomes than average, or that they are poorer or whatever, can be made visible to policymakers. So I think I wouldn't quite share your analysis that this is necessarily a bad thing. It can be a bad thing. It can be an absolutely necessary thing. And I think the difference is kind of good and bad governments, essentially, and that's a problem that data can't really solve. That's about democracy. Yeah, James. Yeah, I was going to make that, say that word democracy, because I think it's, um, it's sort of a question of power and who decides ultimately. And I, I think it feels increasingly clear that we don't want, you know, if you have a purely kind of profit motive driven um, incentive structure around these very large platforms, then you get the addiction economy and you get them incentivized to kind of suck us ever deeper in. Um, on the other hand, do you want government you know, would it be better than having Mark Zuckerberg running Facebook to have the government running Facebook and having access to that data and that power? So it's kind of, um, you know, who, who would you trust or kind of what, what mechanisms for legitimacy or democratic mechanisms would you trust with the kind of power that these, that these platforms have? And I don't, I, I don't think we, that's, that's going to be a new kind of thing. We, we've never created that kind of thing before because we've never had this kind of power before. But it will, we will have to find some way to kind of um, govern these things that feels legitimate and that feels democratic, mm -hmm. as you say. There isn't either one end of that spectrum of the kind of, it's just a private company or it's just the state running this thing and something new will emerge there, I suspect. I feel the phrase tyranny of the majority coming on, but Jenny, um, is open data a good thing? <laughs> um, I, I was just going to 
just make one point around the, this question around data. We tend to talk about data as if it's something that kind of falls from the sky, as if it's a natural phenomenon mm -hmm. that we're just, and, and the oil analogy doesn't help with this, right? It's something that you just suck up from the ground and it's just there, but it isn't, it's designed to your point, right? Mm -hmm. The categories and the structures that we, that we decide to use as a society then shape how we think about people, about everything, right? Um, and so they become really important, and I think that that's how we design, precisely to your point, how do we bring communities into that design? Some of the things that I find most hopeful are the work that I've seen from indigenous communities, from gypsy and traveler communities, who are collecting data about themselves to represent themselves as they see themselves. And, and that bringing that into the data mix is what I think we need in order to get a fuller picture and in order to avoid avoid some of these harms. So the countdown time of doom has turned red now. Um, we've got a few <laughs> minutes left. I'd like to try and fit in another couple of questions. If there are any burning ones here, but just before I take, well, that, that will be the last one from, from here, but just before that, question from Anshuman Ayanga from Innovate UK, so, you know, a funder okay. who, you know, um, uh, expanding on platform domination data concentration, would data be the new oil in the metaverse, and could, would regulations <laughs> meant for the bricks and mortar world be valid for the virtual world at all in the future? Quick answers. I doubt it. I doubt <laughs> it, right. <laughs> Anyone want to get, get more on the fence than that? Or? <laughs> I mean, this is, this is the thing that makes your blood run cold, is the, kind of, is the metaverse, where does that end? And I know there's a lot of scepticism, kind of, because it looks pretty naff, frankly, at the moment. <laughs> but I, I, it, like it, the logic is there. With that, with that is where we're headed. We're headed to far greater use of augmented, augmented reality, virtual reality, more immersed in, us spending more of our time immersed in these platforms. Um, and that's kind of one of the things that makes me think something will have to change. Like this, this is going to get a lot worse if we don't change something quite fundamental. So virtual food doesn't work very well. <laughs> I mean, it, it, and, and what happens in that virtual environment is that every single thing that you do is monitored. It, it becomes a data becomes stream data. that connects us again to each other. So I think it's more that all of the issues that we've been talking about here are just magnified. Mm. So we'll have the question here briefly, I hope. All right, yeah, hello. Thanks for the talk. Um, coming back to a uh, question, like to the question previously discussed on whether policymakers actually understand what data is, um, during the discussion, like I saw that, well, very naively, that um, like uh, data scientists were more or less treated as tools or objects, but surely I think they have minds of their own, optimistically, if we assume that. Um, so, like, basically my question would be, do you think, like, data scientists understand what data is, what their implications are, <laughs> and, um, well, do you think they need to know this, or do you think if that, like, or right. are they just treated as tools, or do you think they should be implicated in the, like, creation of the policies? Okay. And if so, what are the dangers quick, quick, of quick, quick answers. Do data scientists have minds of their own? <laughs> <laughs> Should they be involved? <laughs> Yes, they do have minds of their own. I think, I think the analogy or the, the place to look is, is how statisticians have um, the, the, the uh, kind of rules around how they um, need to, to do their job. And we need similar kinds of things for data scientists. They, they're not exempt from those, those kinds of issues. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And I think, you know, we, we can't expect in a complicated system, you can't expect any person to know everything. So, you know, I expect doctors to know their job, but that doesn't mean that I think we only need doctors to run the health service. You know, in a similar way, you know, doctors have ethics, they have all kinds of things, but you still need more than that. And I think that's such a, however brilliant data scientists are, and they are brilliant, and I certainly didn't mean to malign them, that can't be all, you can't only have data scientists to run a good data system. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think we're, we're all sort of quite small boats on a very choppy sea, if that makes sense as a metaphor. And um, so it, there's only so much we can achieve, however much we individually understand this stuff, understand data and do our best. I think it, it, it's got to be a sort of systems level, institution level conversation. So. We have a few seconds left for one quick fire question. We've talked about lessons from history. What about lessons from fiction? Which, which, which books or, or, or similar fictional ideas give you inspiration, positive or negative? <laughs> Can I squeeze in one recommendation? So, um, science fiction, genuinely, I think, is fascinating and can 
um, spark thoughts. There's a great book called Too Like, Too like the Lightning, which yeah. is the first of a trilogy, I think. Um, fascinating. It's a kind of distant future sci-fi novel, which gave me a lot of thoughts. I was going to borrow from, from James's Industrial Revolution analogy and think about those sort of, you know, North and South and um, Middlemarch and some of those fantastic novels about trying to reconcile kind of old and new and the social pressures of the new economy being... And, and the sort of values of the old economy and how these things can, um, you know, can be, can be reconciled. Jenny. And I will point to a series of uh, things that have been um, led at the ODI by Millie Zimiter, who's the head of policy there, who split them up into um, attention on Asimov, um, Ursula Le Guin and Octavia Butler as different kinds of ways into the, and, and different approaches to the questions around data. Fantastic. Well, thanks to all three of you. It's been really wonderful to have you with us to talk so fluently and fluidly about so many of these issues and the analogies. Thanks to the attendees here in person and online. Thanks to the university and the Cambridge Festival. And it's been really great to work with the Bennett Institute on Public Policy again. So please do try and stay in touch with all the news and research from the Bennett Institute. Uh, look on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on Facebook, I presume. Um, and, of course, the new shiny website, bennettinstitute.cam.ac.uk. Thank you all very much. Have a good evening. Thank you.